Okay, folks, uh, we're ready for the second presenter for the day, and that's uh, David Delane who will be talking, us, talking to us about uh, data management. A little bit of background, uh, David received both his, uh, his BS, which was in uh, uh, applied physics, and his master's of science in uh, geophysics at the Michigan Technological University in 1998, just up the road at Laramie, received his PhD in atmospheric science, then spent a few years here in Boulder at Ceres doing some work with um, aerosols, and that's his expertise, and since 2001, he's been a member of the faculty of the University of North Dakota, Department of Atmospheric Sciences. And let's give a, a nice welcome for David Deline. Um, so since um, about 2002, when I got to the University of North Dakota, I've been working with our citation research aircraft. And what I thought I would do today is talk a little bit about the data management we have with the aircraft. And this is just an example of all the instruments we have from the uh, IFEX project, which is a NASA project we did in the spring of 2014 um, out of Asheville, North Carolina. We did a lot of flying out of the uh, East Coast um, also out over the ocean. So there's a lot of instruments on here. We have a data system and I do all the processing of the data, have my own package for doing that, do the quality assurance of data, and then we get this into the NASA archive for that scientist to analyze. So I thought what I would do today is kind of a user case of uh, explaining all the stuff we do with this data, but we'll jump to the end and I thought we would um, I'll give you um, hopefully on the um, WMATA server, um, we updated the stuff. So as, um, as I talk here, you can listen, and I'll put this back up at the end, or if you want, you can go ahead and try the exercise to begin with. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm jumping to the end. We did this field project, we put the data into the NASA archive, you can get the science files from the archive, I'll go through that. Um, I put one of these up on the Ramada server. Um, there's a big tar bar there now, so the best thing to do is to download that tar bar and uncompress it. So this is supposed to be kind of interactive. The other thing I want to do is not to show you my tools, but to try to demonstrate how we use the tools that we've talked about this week and how that would fit into the data um, management that we do at the um, with the aircraft as a user case. So how do all these tools fit together to manage data um, on the site? And I got a, a presentation to go through this um, and you can listen to that and we can do this at the end since we got about an hour. Um, and I'll show you some of the successes that we have on doing this. So your assignment, what you should try to do is um, we went out and did this aircraft flight. There's a uh, .ifex um, file on the site, which is a ASCII data file that has a metadata header in it. And what I want you to do is analyze this data, and one of two things is um, let's do a profile of the data, and then we can compare that profile to HERS profile. So what I've done, is um, there's a NASA file that um, PY, these are Python codes. So this is to read this data file format in into Python. Gives you a dictionary that has all the variables there. So you can plot that up in Python if you're really good. Um, but um, I have this I plot routine on that. If you can run that, um, I typically do this from the command line. So if you can get that running and generate a profile that's one of your tasks. Um, and then, um, working with some of the Unidata folks, we got this fetch data.py program that will go out and fetch using, um, um, oh, sorry, go back here. This one, um, the IFEX plot uses the um, metpy routine. And then this one fetches the data from the HERS model. 
And the big challenge, if you're really good, is to try to put these two together and make a combined profile. Okay, there's no solution for that right now. Um, so that's one, one goal. The second goal is we talked a lot about IDV. So one of the things you would want to do for uh, science analysis, right, would be to, let's see if we can prod up this data. There's a routine that I had that converts this um, IFEX file into a uh, CF compliant net CDF file. And I worked with people yesterday to get that work in. Um, so there's a routine there um, that does the conversion. You can look at it, it, it does the convert. If you untar the tar bar, you'll see that the latest version. The old one from the day before probably won't work. So try to get the tar bar. And um, we'll uncompress that. And, uh, and then you should have a, uh, a net CDF file that you can roll into IDV. So when your IDV, roll in that file. And I'm old school, so I'm sorry I don't have no uh, notebook on this. But if you look at the beginning of that file, it'll tell you how to roll this up into IDV. And then try to overlay some uh, radar data. Pull up some recent data from yesterday or today um, and overlay the radar data. So that's the, the challenge that I hope you can kind of try to work on um, while I'm talking. And if you want, you can just listen to me and we can try to do this after the, at the end. But for them that want to try to go ahead, you can try to start that. And then at the end, maybe we'll see where you're stuck. Um, and so I'll talk for about 20 minutes. Um, so I'm trying to make this a little bit interactive and then you don't have to just listen to me. Is there any questions before I start talking? Okay, um, I will try to make a, um, a notebook and put this all together too. I'm hoping that this would help people that want to take something away from the, the workshop. Hopefully this will be a, an example of the project. So if you want to just listen, we'll get back to this at the end of my what a presentation, going over some of the stuff that I do. Uh, so we have instruments. Um, you know, it's similar to models, but the amount of data we generate is not nearly as much. Um, this is all time series data. It's not radar data. It's not satellite data. And it's not model data. So the amount of data we have is a lot less. But we want to manage this data um, from the instrument observations to the science analysis. So I just explained some type of analysis that you would want to do. But what goes on before you start that analysis? And this is something that's sometimes lacking for students and people that haven't gone through this. They just get the data set already given to them. But you've got to remember all the stuff that goes on beforehand. So I'm doing this now. We have several projects in July where we're planning a deployment of the aircraft. And this is true for um, all fields, uh, doing wolf modeling, doing observations. You want to plan your analysis at the beginning. You know, you don't want to have to go and try to um, have some data and try to figure out something to do with it afterwards. Ideally, you take the data and you plan how you provide a platform so that you have some data that you can scientifically analyze. Um, the other thing that we do a lot of when we're taking this data is we do what I call quality control. And this is to ensure the instruments are performing as expected. Okay, um, that's my definition. We do tests of the instruments to make sure that there's no leaks in the instruments, that we're getting them to size correctly. Um, this is not just seeing if they got power. This is doing specific checks, um, typically every week, that the instruments are performing correctly. Um, the next step um, that we try to do is the quality assurance. Um, all of our aircraft data, we have tons of problems that happen. Um, almost every flight, we have something that doesn't work correctly. You know, we have a loose wire on the uh, data acquisition board, so our analog to digital converter, we get rid of spikes in the data. 
um, turn on the instrument as a power surge um, at the beginning. Um, all these things are not realistic valid data that you want to analyze scientifically. So an expert has to review that data and make that determination. Is this data at all scientifically useful? If it's not, you have to replace that with a missing value code. You know, the data has to be missing. And this is not like a quality frag. I just think, is it, quality, is it good enough for anything? And if it's not, you have to take that out. And these are things that I don't think can be automated. Okay, you can look for range checks and stuff. You can automate that. This is stuff that you really have to understand the science of the instrument, how it works. And the best way to use tools then is to make it as easy for the scientist that understands the instrument to review the data. And it, we have a tool for that that I built in IDL because I started building this 15, 20 years ago before we had Python. So we have a nice tool to do that, kind of specialized for this, but we can plot up all the parameters very quickly, compare different things. Um, if anybody's interested, I can show you that tool later, but I don't plan to go over the specifics of that. Um, the other thing we need to do is um, we want to process the, um, the measurements very quickly, and we want to make sure that they're uh, free from mistakes. Um, typically um, open source code. Um, so like we heard previously that you know you should use subversion um, control, some uh, control of your software versions. So since 2007 I've been using a um, subversion database. Um, so all my codes in there. I got about 200,000 lines of code to process the data from these instruments. The other thing is, is what is scary to me sometimes that we see now at we have all these different versions of the code sometimes with these containers. All my, my software set that's in the database now will work to process all the data since 2000. Okay, one code base that is sophisticated enough to process data from all the field projects that we've been involved with. And that takes some doing to make sure that you can do that and that you don't break stuff. Um, sometimes when the things break and you gotta go back and fix it. Um, but then it's reproducible, you can look at that. And then at the end, typically we submit it to an, uh, either um, a NASA archive, they want to predict the directory structure, they take care of it. If it's a smaller project, we put in a directory structure. I have not used anything like a MySQL database, we just have a defined um, directory structure. Um, but I think the Ramada server would be something that would be really useful for organizing some of the data um, in the, to be able to quickly visualize the data um, that we have after the fight. And then you start your analysis. Um, and the big thing with the analysis is to make sure you have the files in formats that are easily convertible and documented. So all the files have metadata in it. And I don't worry about the particular format we just convert it to whatever you want. So that, i.e., the, the net CDF data. Um, it's not the file format that I typically use, but I'll just convert it to that. And then you can use that in IDV, you can use that into the Ramada server. Um, we do that for other pieces of software. So that's kind of the overview of the data management. And I'm thinking about this in terms of getting to the point where you have all this, these um, data to go into your archive, not necessarily just the archiving process. I mean, the archiving process to me is trivial. You just have to get everything together. But to get this data so that you understand it, like the quality assurance, we keep track of all them quality assurance. We keep track of the fright notes. All this stuff has to be generated so that when you get it to the archive, you have all the data there, all the province um, to archive. So I'm not so concerned about how you actually archive the data. I'm more concerned about how you manage the system ahead of time to generate the data that's necessary so that you can have it there so that you can do your scientific analysis. So I'll try to keep this interactive. Is there any questions? I was going to go through each one of these steps, show you some of the tools that I use, and then summarize what we can use from this workshop at the end. So.
just a quick comment. Um, my colleague and I work at with the folks at the National Center for Centers for Environmental Information in North Carolina, which was formerly the National Climatic Data Center. And this is so important in terms of having that information available for the archivists. It, you know, I mean, they they spend a lot of time pulling their hair out over the lack of information. And so this is this is really important, having a good, rich set of metadata to provide to the archivists. And so, yeah. Um, yeah, and that's where I think of the data management is, is coming up with this and how we have the tools to be able to do that because this is a lot of hard work. And so my idea is let's use the tools to make it as easy as possible. Um, and I, I'll try to highlight some of the tools that we use to do this so that we can generate this stuff. Um, because um, it's, it's for the field project that we're on, but then I think we're going to have to start uh, getting out of this mode of just having one field project and analyzing just for that. We want to analyze across field projects across years. Um, I have a colleague now that we're trying to go back and look at data from 1989. Oh, that's incredibly hard, you know, because we don't have all this information. Um, and again, it's a little bit difficult because when we do these NASA projects, in a lot of sense, they pay us to fly the airplane and put hours on the aircraft. And this is kind of incidental um, in terms of some project managers' um, viewpoints. Um, but it, so, and it's not something else that is, um, it's hard to generate um, like scientific publications out of this, you know, because if I document my code, I provide all this stuff, you know, it's not peer reviewed. Um, it's not something that, um, but we do a good job, then hopefully we get the NASA project on this. So, um, and I hope, you know, by giving this to particularly the younger people in the audience that um, you demand this of people that are providing you data. That if you start analyzing data, you're given a data set, you should know that, expect to have some of this information given to you and go back and look at it in terms of, well, I'm going to analyze some crowd dropper probe data. Well, you should go back and look at the quality control checks that were done on that. You should go back and look and see if there was any edits that were applied to that. Um, and expect that, um, that you don't just get the final data set and that's where you should start. Um, so, yeah, I, I love the comments. So, um, okay, so um, what, I'm starting at the end and I'm going to work backwards in a sense. Um, so this is an NASA uh, data set archive. So the file I gave you is this um, IFEX um, file. And if you want, you can go grab it from this um, uh, FTP site. I gave you the direct link to that. Um, and there's a bunch of other files there. So hopefully this is kind of a give you something to take home um, that you can start with um, if you want to use some of the tools that are available. So. You can go out and grab the data um, here. I just picked one kind of random day. Um, I was on this flight um, that we did. It was kind of exciting. And I just randomly picked this. The other thing I think we're going to hear, hear um, about later on is the, uh, see, I don't have it in, um, yeah, I, I took it out of this one. We don't have the DOI number yet for this data set. NASA hasn't issued that yet. Um, but we've done other ones for GCPEX and M33E for the G GPM satellite. And if you go to the, um, my list, um, I list DOI numbers for the data sets. And there is a DOI number um, if you go on to here. Um, I just didn't add it in here. So digital object identifiers we'll talk about later. But I have that for the data sets, for the software, and for the publications. So not just for the publications that I do. So we try to keep track of that. Um, so there's a data set you can grab. Um, so I talk a little bit about um, we process the data. So I'm not going to demonstrate the tool too much except to say that we have this airborne data processing analysis package. Um, I have it up on SourceForge. Um, it's free available, got a license on it. Um, Everything's been in there since uh, 2007. I'm on version 
2,314 as of a couple of days ago. Got over 200,000 lines of code. Um, and again, sorry that uh, I started this before we had Python, so it's a mix of IDL, Perl, Bash, CSL, Fortran, C, um, and a few other other things in there. Um, it, and hopefully going forward, I'm starting writing everything in Python. So I won't rewrite these 200,000 lines of code, but what I would do is I'll start writing everything new in Python, have one language that can fill all these needs. I really see that as something there. But um, I can't replace um, the stuff because I can't take a year or two. And when I started in 2001, basically everything was written in Fortran 77. Okay, this was year 2000. So over the next 10 years, I rewrote it all in IDL. So um, now it's let's move it on to Python. Um, but it's um, pretty good. Um, but to me, the language doesn't matter. Uh, I'm sorry to say that. I mean, Python's good, but um, if you understand one of these modern languages, it's pretty easy to understand the others. And to me, I, I don't get bogged down in languages. So my package, I don't really care. Um, we use Subversion control system. Um, they have a, a bug tracker and form on there. I'm trying to get other people to use this. I've used this on several different aircraft. Um, I've used this on, uh, we've done surface measurements with the same data process and methodology. We did uh, balloon flights, we've done rocket flights. Um, so the day, anything that's time series can be processed with this package, visualized. Um, so it's really specialized on time series data. Um, and the big thing that I use is the wikis. I started using these in 2007. That's one way to track um, quality control. And that's why I like Ramada. I think it's kind of like a wiki on steroids. And I can see a lot of advantages to moving to that. But it's, to me, it's not really a new concept. I'm, uh, I just think it's um, a more refinement. Um, also, I got papers that we published on this site with, again, a DOI on the paper um, related to the package. And you can go and download the whole package. And, and it's available. Um, and I don't expect people that review papers to actually go look at the code, um, but I'm open to anybody, um, I'm willing to say, hey, please point out if there's something wrong in some of my analysis. Or go and look at how I process the crowd condensation nuclear data, okay, or the crowd physics data. If you want to learn about it, it's all there in the code. Um, but it's a little bit difficult when you talk to people that don't know how to code. They're like, well, how did you process this? I want to report about how you process the data. I'm like, well, it's all in the code. Just go read the code. They're like, no, I can't read code. <laughs> so um, it's a little bit tricky to, because it always changes, too. So with the subversion, um, the metadata files we have, we have a, time have a time stamp on that of when the data was processed. So the IFX file, if you look at it, um, in the header information, there should be a process date on it. Um, because I have the subversion control system, I can extract the code on that day and I can reproduce that exact file because I have the code and I know exactly when that file was produced. So I'm not reliant on the fact that I have to make my latest um, version work. Um, so here's the example um, I have of what I would do to process the IFX file um, right up here. There's a master script called process all IFX. Um, and it will go through and take the raw data file, this .sea file that we get off the data system that is recorded on the aircraft, records all the instruments um, uh, at one time into this data file. It's a binary data file format um, that uh, has all the raw data in that that I process. And basically, we have certain concepts in mind when we have to do this processing. One is missing value codes that go throughout the data processing. So if one um, low-level data file has a missing value code, the higher-level processing has to handle the missing value codes. Um, then there's also the concept of data levels. Um, this is kind of borrowed from NASA. A lot of people, are the, people have this concept of data levels. You know, raw data, we have um, voltage measurements that can be converted to physical units. 
I typically will break everything out into individual um, instrument files. And that's one data level where I process all the instrument files up. And then we have to combine different instruments because we don't want to look at just one instrument. We want to combine them all together. And then typically we make a science file that will just pick out the important scientifically important parameters. Not all the parameters that we record that we use to do our quality assurance, but the ones you're going to analyze for your um, scientific analysis. Um, everything's automated, so this whole script runs. Um, it takes 20 or 30 minutes on this laptop, any of these computers. Um, because this is a subversion control system, I have um, two dozen computers that can process this data. Um, but we have these in the field. We have this process right after the flight. Um, typically, um, we get the data off the aircraft, run it process, and then go have uh, dinner, come back, and look at the results and do our quality assurance. Um, I use um, the, the started data file as um, a binary data file, but I convert it to ASCII as soon as possible so that when I'm doing them on my uh, process, and it's all processed on ASCII file formats. If you care about the file size, you can compress them. IDL now will work directly with the compressed gzip files. Not a problem. Um, we want to understand the file formats. And, not, and, and that's another thing. I like that better than NetCDF for the data processing um, because I can look at it directly and really easier than a NetCDF file. Um, we have uh, synchronous and asynchronous data, any frequencies. All these different instruments are done at different frequencies, different parameters, some of them are asynchronous data, some are synchronous. They're not all synchronized in time. We have to do that all in the data processing. We have to average them all up to one science file, and that's what I've given you, is this one hertz, one second um, science file. And that's what this is in this um, ASCII format, and that's what the converter does to convert that to the um, that CDF file, and right now I'm not converting everything. I'm just giving you pressure and temperature along with the altitude, um, position, and time information. But I will extend that to put all the files that's all in the ASCII file right into that, and, every, and then I can just add that to my script, and we can have that come right out um, in this file. I had an older version that would make another net CDF file that wasn't CF compliant, so this is not the first time I used net CDF. Um, a lot of our users, the other thing with using the ASCII files is they're very unsophisticated. Let's just put into Excel. So these ASCII files that depend on the data header go right into Excel. Um, also, I have ingesters from MATLAB, IDL, Python, um, Excel, obviously, so that you can just ingest the files into whatever data analysis program you want. As long as the metadata is there and it's documented, what's the point of who cares what the file format is. So, um, and if you do care, you just convert it. So I don't get hung up with the file formats. I just convert it to whatever and, um, and give it to whoever wants it in whatever program we want. The big thing is documenting the file formats. That's the big thing is I've, I have to decode data from instruments and they have documentation maybe and maybe sometimes it's wrong. Um, I have a case recently where I have to go sit down with the programmer because there's no pro documentation. He wrote the code to stick out the data files and I'm like, no documentation. Um, the other big thing that um, I don't think we talked about too much but is a big issue with what um, we do with the aircraft stuff is the quality assurance. I distinguish quality assurance from quality control in the fact that Quality assurance can be done after the field project. Quality control is only stuff you can do while you have access to the instruments. Um, quality assurance is when an expert looks at the data files um, and not with an automated script, but looks at them with the eyes of someone that understands the instrument. And I can teach this to undergraduate students. Typically, I can say, OK, here, read the manual about the temperature probe. You know, understand what the temperature fluctuations in the atmosphere are like. You know, how fast can they fluctuate? Um, you know, what's the range of temperatures in the atmosphere? Um, and go and look at the, these are a few little things that usually come up. And, um, you know, you can go through and do the quality assurance. 
Um, so what I have is I have a what I call a CPROP program with a bunch of GUIs. It's all graphical. Basically, it's a time series data. Um, it's XY plot, so you can plot on different things. You can have a different axis. Um, basically, you have a menu to select which parameters you have. Um, this is really nice to look at the data right after the flight, to see the whole flight. Um, the idea is you look at the different data files um, on a flight by flight basis. Um, and it's really, and this is also automates all the quality assurance. You can select the time intervals if there's any problems with the data. You select that time interval, and you can automatically create an edit file. So here's my edit. I think this time, you know, there's a spike in the data here. I got to take this out. This is the reason I'm taking this out. You document who did it, when they did it, and why, and you keep track of that. And that way, you're on the hot seat to explain why you did that edit why you had to remove that data. And it's all edited. And that edit file gets created, and the data process and handles that to automatically generate what I call a clean file, which is the raw data that has the edits applied to them. So we don't destroy the raw data, we don't replace it, we create a whole new file. So the process and will always look to see if that clean file is there, and that's what's used to create the science files, if they exist, or any subsequent processing at a higher data level in the automatic process. And um, this also helps with some routine analysis. You can do statistics to look at different things. Um, but this is kind of this, the, um, you know, a basic pro program that I wrote. And uh, anybody interested, they can um, download this. This is just a standalone IDL program that you can run in the virtual machine. So anybody can download this. And this is the other thing that I can give to a lot of people that have the data sets, right? I give them the uh, ASCII data file, and here's the program to view it. So you don't have to do any coding at all. You got a GUI interface, you can look at the data. Um, you know, this is not well documented, but you have something to look at the data. Um, you have a way to look at it and visualize it. Um, and, it and I need to do that in a way so I can do the quality assurance of the data. So I try to pause any questions or comments um, on how we do these. And uh, of course, I can demonstrate these tools, but I don't know that there's a wide audience that would want to use this. But if you've got some time series data, um, you, this tool is free available. Or there's something else. Um, I started writing this because there was nothing available when I um, had this. And even now, there's some stuff that comes close, but nothing that can do everything that I want. Um, for this. Um, so that's, I'm going backwards here. Um, the quality assurance is kind of done after the field projects or after the flight. Um, typically, if we're, we're um, very um, busy, um, we'll look at the data, but we won't look at it in the, the depth that we have to um, for the quality assurance. Typically, NASA will give us, for example, six months after the completion of the field project to go back and do the quality assurance. However, doing it as quickly as possible is very valuable because then you can catch some problems. You can as well go in and create your edit files if you can. So you might do some initial quality assurance at that time and then do some more afterwards. But where you really busy doing the quality control, um, and this is a process of conducting tests to ensure the measurements are made correctly and accurately. Um, this is not calibrations. The instruments should be calibrated before the field project. Um, a lot of times we do similar methods that we use for calibrations. Um, but one of the other things that we really do, particularly since in the introduction they, sent, they said I'm an aerosol person, um, this is a pressurized aircraft. We're trying to measure aerosols, which really means bring the airstream into the instrument. Um, and we want to bring that in without having the cabin air get into the instrument. Okay, this is a very basic concept to make sure you don't have a leak in the system. Um, and, uh, but do you know you don't have a leak? Um, these systems always leak. So what I do to people, I ask them, well, what's your leak rate? Oh, we don't have no leaks. Well, I know you do then because it's going to leak some. And if you tell me you don't have a leak in your system, that means you didn't measure it. You didn't do the quality control. Um, 
I, we do stuff as simple as this. You put a handheld vacuum pump on there, go out there, you don't need any electricity, um, and do this. And um, I give you an example of a plot here from a field project. Um, this is an, another aerosol instrument. That's this total number of concentrations. This is a cloud condensation nuclide concentrations. And if you do this scatter plot, there's these measurements down here, which um, it, they're believable. They're not um, measurements that you would uh, necessarily have to reject. Um, however, they're a little bit strange when you compare them to all the other flights um, and stuff. Um, so it gives you a frag, and it, right after this flight, um, you know, I was on the flight, I was kind of noticing, no, nah, they're pretty low, but I was very busy. So then I plot this up, and it's like, boy, these are very low, um, only a couple hundred. You know, I could come up with all kinds of reasons that that might occur, but I'm like, mm, maybe we develop a leak in the system. And sure enough, you go back, we put the leak check on the system after that flight, and the system leaked. Okay? So basically, this is one flight of data. This was at the beginning of the field project. Okay, if I didn't have the software and the tools there, this would have persisted throughout the whole field project. Okay, so you want to catch this after one flight as opposed to 20. Okay, um, and this is the idea that you have to have these set up, you have to have the software so you can look at the data after the flights. So that means tools available to be able to look at the data. So we can do that now where before it was very difficult and we would have to catch stuff in real time. So when we're flying, we try to catch a lot of stuff, make notes of what's going on. We have a flight engineer, I call him, and his primary responsibility is just to watch a data system and make sure that the instruments are behaving correctly. Um, but you don't catch everything. And something like this, um, it would be very difficult to catch in real time. So, um, and then again, we do this week check every week. So ideally, um, we would do, have conducted this check again, and we would have caught it after a couple of flights. So, um, and this is very important to do on your very um, important scientific instruments um, that are important for your scientific analysis. Um, so I'm back at the beginning now is um, we try to always do operational plans. This is not a science plan. You know, the science plan tells you your science objectives, what you want to accomplish, what type of uh, scientific questions you're addressing. The operations plan is how you're going to do that. You know, who's going to be fine, when are you going to have the teleconferences, when are you going to have the weather forecast, what type of profiles you're going to fly, um, <coughs> how are you going to fly in the storms, um, you know, what kind of crime rates do you have to ha maintain so that you get good data? How do you communicate this between the pirate and the scientist? <clears throat> and um, so I'm developing one of these for our project that we're going to do in Florida at the end of July. So I'll write this operations plan draft um, this weekend um, so that we're all on the same page. Um, people on the ground, people in the aircraft, we know how we're going to operate the field project ahead of time um, so that we can get the best measurements to do the analysis that we want. So that we're not just randomly flying the aircraft to take measurements that we hope will be useful. Um, you know, for example, we want to look at profiles through the crowd here. We need to penetrate at different levels where we're interested in getting some profiles down low and some up high. Um, we want to turn around. We want to um, go with the storm. We want to make sure we sample at appropriate speed. Um, 160 knots, if we go really fast, it degrades the quality of the instruments. Um, so this is standard practice. This can go into the um, documentation that goes into the data sets, um, which is something that is not um, a science paper. It's not something with, that has the science objectives, but it's how you're going to implement them. And um, it's kind of obvious to do this. Um, but again, if you're analyzing data sets, you should not just look at just the science plan, but you should look at the operations plan and how this was conducted um, for that. Um, so I'm kind of at the end of my presentation part. So 
Um, I can show you a little bit of, since I got the, um, um, my laptop here, I can give you some of the details and I can show you, um, I guess, how I would do it. Has anybody um, not been listening and um, have done the conversion? Has done the, um, the profiles? Anybody? Okay, now we have to do it. Um, so um, I'll try a couple of them. Um, I'll just go out of my um, presentation here and I'll find um, where I have the, and if, uh, um, most people have Macs and uh, Linux systems, I hope. Um, even some of this stuff, I'm not sure of exactly how to do it in Windows, but um, the Python code should work just fine. Um, so if you, um, uh, I guess, if you, uh, uh, XVF. So you should um, download the, um, the tarball file. And so if you downloaded a tarball file and just uncompress it um, with tar, you should get all the different data files. Um, so I'm trying to go slowly here. And I'll try to put this, um, I, I'm assuming that the, um, the notebook, you know, while it's good for um, Python stuff, that you could document stuff with command line options and stuff in there too. So I think maybe after I get done with this, I'll try to make a notebook that we can put this together and that would give me a better experience. I'm, I'm not so sold on the notebooks, but I'm going to try it. So I don't criticize anything until I try it. So um, I think I'll try to make a notebook so that, um, but I haven't had time because I was trying to get everything working um, for this. Um, so anyway, you should get a data management directory. Um, which has the PDF file that I just went over and then it has a directory called data and codes in there and um, so this is the IFX file this is a data file you can download directly from the archive so if you looked at that FTP link then you just put that into your web browser you would get this file um, uh, just to give you a, a sense of what this is I'll just bring it up into um, a text browser. Um, so this is the metadata header. It's a special NASA format. Um, NASA Ames and developed these NASA formats before. Um, and it's documented what this is. Um, lines of code, it's all time series data files. There's 51 parameters in here. Um, these are the missing value codes long name descriptions of the variables. So when I convert this to the netcdf file, um, oh. Yes, sorry. I didn't notice that. Um, so this is the, um, the ASCII version. And I just write the converter because all the information that you need for your um, attributes in your netcdf file are basically in here. I just have to make sure I have the compliant one. I mean, this goes with the, um, uh, what is it, Rosetta that we talked about yesterday where you can do the same thing. Um, I, I just write a converter in, in Python to do this because all the information is in here. And that's why I don't really care about the format as long as the information is in here. Um, so you got the long name descriptions that will hopefully explain everything about the data files, even um, on some of these, for example, here. Um, I try to put the um, slope and offset uh, calibrations that, you, that are used to go from the voltage measurement um, to the physical units and try to keep that in there. Um, channel boundaries, anything that I can put in there um, to do that. Um, there's even an option put special comments in here. Um, and I try to put everything in here. Um, I'm waiting for users to come back and always say, no. I don't understand what this parameter is. Well, I'll just make it longer and more descriptive. Um, so we do that um, with this. Um, I guess this is still in label permanent data. I should really have labeled it final data. Um, I try to distinguish between preliminary data that's done right after the fright and final data that gets into the data archive. This should have been labeled final data. 
Um, it's one hertz data, and then I have a, what a header here, um, and this is base delimited instead of common delimited. Um, this is historic. Um, this data file was preceding when I was there, and sometimes you don't fight um, history, you just deal with it. Um, so sorry um, if it's space, but you should be able to do it, deal with spaces as opposed to commas. The other thing that's kind of funny about this is it's 12 characters long or 11 characters in a space. Um, so everything fits into 11 characters. So my short names are limited to 11 characters. Um, and I just make these up. I should go back now and actually change some of these short names and be a little bit more conformal to the community. But I'll just translate these into the, the, the agreed upon standards of NetCDF afterwards. Um, all my files have time um, as a first uh, value, and it's in seconds for midnight when the data f when the flight began. Um, we never go uh, more than a day flying. Obviously, we were about three hours, four hours on flights. Um, but it's continuous if we go past um, midnight UTC. This is always UTC. I don't jump back and start my time over. So it's continuous from the midnight of the day the flight started. Um, because otherwise, you've got this time series that starts over and it doesn't make sense to me. Um, and uh, um, we can go through and uh, look at the data. And so that's the data that's available um, on that. And just to, I guess, show off a little bit, um, this is my tool to bring that up. Um, because all the metadata is in there, any of your software just reads that metadata and presents it. Um, this is not a, um, you know, a hard concept. Anybody can program up something that would read that metadata and handle it. Um, but it just really easily um, allows me to do my plots of the data file. So this is what you might have noticed earlier. And uh, you know, nothing fancy. You could do this in Excel. You could do this in uh, um, with the NetCDF files like uh, NCView or something. Um, but it does allow me to time sync and um, subset data. Um, I can grab with the time intervals of the data. And uh, we plot it very quickly and plot multiple parameters and do all my, um, my apply edits, my um, add edits to do my quality assurance so it's all built in. So this is a tool that because I took the philosophy that I cannot write code smart enough to get rid of, to do all the quality assurance. Um, uh, I just think that's impossible to do. That you gotta have a scientist to do this and he needs the tools to be able to do this as efficiently as possible. So that's what this tool is for. Um, okay, so what you need to do is that there is this, um, where is it? Um, Um, well, okay, one thing is the first one is the uh, I um, um, and the um, the Python code and let me make sure you can see this and your screen, okay. So this is the Python code um, on here, um, and I always have the, the header on this, and I'll give you an example of how you would run this. The um, uh, way I do it is I program it up, and then if I want to run it interactively, I do the minus i on there. Um, but it's just a code, and the import a bunch of stuff, so uh, you have to use a, um, one of the Libraries, or I just install everything for my whole um, whole laptop, so I have all the Python um, variables in there. So one of the things with Python is you have to have all the uh, uh, different um, things, including the main ones here, uh, um, the MetPy and Siphon that we talked about earlier. Uh, I do a little bit of cheating. I just give you the starting times of my profiles, and um, we are just going to grab some of the um, um, 
the data here is these are my short names I talked about before so I can grab that data from this dictionary um, put into variables and then um, what I don't have to do is we want to do the skew t plots that we talked about on Tuesday so uh, where do I do that I do this skew t right here this is from the metpy routines so this is an example um, I never heard about this package before Tuesday um, so I'm trying to demo here how easy it is um, to use these new tools which it's somewhat easy because I've done it in two days but I had some help um, to do this um, oh, and I, I, I comment out the show but um, and the way I, I and you have to give it the um, the name and the data file I'll give you a little feedback that it reads in the data file and um, then it creates this um, PNG file. So it goes through, uses a MetPy. So can you try to just run that code? Can someone run the Python code however you want to do it? Everybody does that? Yes? Okay. Pretty easy. I'm trying to make this a little interactive, but yeah, I know that's kind of um, trivial, but um, it's something to take away. Um, and uh, here's the the plot that you get generated, which is a skew t plot with the wind bulbs. I've averaged them up, um, and um, we got that uh, plotted. Um, the other tool in here is we have this fetch program, which um, will work to go out and fetch uh, both radar and skew t and uh, uh, model profile data. Um, at the end here is the HERS sounding in the um, NetCDF file and I haven't quite got this to work but the big challenge is to try to put this together with the previous code and make one profile. So you can work on that but um, we'll skip that for now because I want to show you the other one which is a little bit better in terms of um, let's get this into IDV because the fetch, the reason I'm doing it a fetch is I, I want to do this, I got to fight um, a couple weeks. I want to now, I, I showed you, I've, I've done all my processing, I want to start doing my analysis right after the fight. I want to go out and grab the radar data, I want to go out and grab the, the model data and put this together so not only do I look at the aircraft data, but I'm going to be looking at the model data, uh, all this stuff, and I'll make automated scripts to do this because one of the things is when we do these field projects the radar data is available but it's not available for um, a month and a half or two months or two years later so I need to be able to fetch this data right after the flight um, and I don't know what data I need to fetch until I do the flight um, and if I wait till after the field project a lot of times that data is not available so that's why I think this siphon is really cool to be able to go do that as opposed to use something like IDV. Um, maybe IDV can do this, I should speak, but um, I think you can fetch the data so that you have it available after the flight to put into IDV. Um, but I think fetching the data would be very useful, um, not only for the quality assurance, but then to have that data to start your scientific analysis. Um, and that's one of the things I'm really excited about. So let's get this data file into um, uh, IDV. So this is the Python code. Um, I went through, they had a little example. Um, what I want to do is, this is too, um, this is not gridded data. We have time series data of an aircraft that flies around in the atmosphere. Um, how are we going to combine that with our model data? How are we going to look at that with our radar data? Um, I think IDV is a great tool for doing this and they had some tools built in. They had an example of how to write a, a compliant file with some help from other people here. I was able to um, generate this file so that's why you need to use the radius version um, from the tarball. <coughs> and then um, I'm old school in the sense that I haven't written the notebooks but um, I put a lot of notes at the beginning, including how we ran the code. So here's the way that 
I would render code for my environment just on the bash shell, give it the file and do that. I put on here one of the documents of where the websites are that I use to create the code. Um, and then I put on here testing. Um, so this is how you would test and get it into IDV. Okay, and um, so this is what we should try to do. So I'll, I'll first show you how to write the converter. Um, if you don't care, the file is right here um, to do that. And, um, and I got two minutes left. So it, you can render the code or you can just um, um, open that up into IDV. And um, there's steps about how to do that in the thing. Basically, you got to go into the data chooser and open up it from a file, choose the right format, and then, um, as I give the demo here, um, here's the flight tracks with the temperature overlaid where a recent radar data. So I'll stop there um, and let you try to, before lunch, maybe if they can do that and see if you got any help. But I'm trying to hopefully give you some tools that you can take home um, to apply a couple of the tools that I really think. And um, if I take 30 seconds again to do in a final slide, um, I'm on view. Um, ah. Get to the end because I've done one more thing is these are the list of tools that I use for the different things. And in the um, black are the things that I'm going to take away from this workshop to start adding to my list of toolboxes. Um, you know, I'll start using IDV a little bit more. I've used that some, but I think we can use that. Um, Docker, I've used VMware's um, virtual machines before. Docker is very really cool. So this weekend, I'm going to make a Docker for my uh, ADPA package. Um, Supposedly it can run on the Windows. That would be kind of cool. Um, I, I use CPLOT that I showed you. I don't see anything that can do visualization or quality control. Um, Ramada, I'm really excited about Ramada because I really like wiki pages and I think that would be great. And then as I demonstrated here, um, MetPy, uh, Siphon, IDV, Ramada would all be good um, for helping to do the documentation, the quality control, and everything. So. I will stop. All right, thank you very much, David. And I would say uh, for folks who are working through the examples, um, you know, we've got the two hour lunch break. If, if David will be around, uh, you know, it's okay, you can eat some lunch too, but uh, be around to uh, help folks out. Um, I was able to load up just the NetCDF file that was sitting in the data files directory and just uh, make sure that people load it as a NetCDF point data because if you just load it right away, it will, it will by default think it's a grid file. So just load it, It'll, it will prompt you and say load as another data type and just choose a NetCDF slash GEMPAC point data file. Yeah. Trajectory profile? Yeah. And that's okay. in the documentation of the the convert program, but yeah. okay, it's great. It's a directory file, and so questions for David. Okay, thanks again. <laughs> a logistics note um, for those of you who brought posters. Now might be a good time to gather it, uh, just so there isn't a scramble at the end and you need to catch the bus back to the uh, millennium. Um, so we've got uh, lunch and then we'll have uh, Matt Meiernick at two o'clock with uh, the final presentation. So uh, we'll reconvene at two o'clock. <laughs>